What intensified also was that every single morning, my students got a motivational thought and a motivational activity. They're also a problem of the day that you must solve. So the problem was, was contextualized in the setting. So we, we, we had reasoning at a certain point, we had probability at a certain point because we wanted them to maneuver their circumstances at a certain way. And then the physical structure of the school was also changed. Dr. Thomas, I, I personally believe that the Ministry of Education will have to start to clown persons and they maybe need to clown you to put you in more of those schools across um, Jamaica. Because as I listened to you, I said, this is truly a visionary leader. You have become a catalyst for everything that happened. I hear you talk about, you 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 allow this, this um, thing to start happening in your school before it actually happened. So you created the change before the change happened. That that yeah. is that is so significant. I told you we were talking to a woman who is creating impact and influence in her field. Dr. Marcia Thomas is joining us from Jamaica on the fireside chat tonight. Dr. Thomas, what parish are you from in Jamaica? What parish is your school? Manchester. Oh, I'm a Manchesterian. Okay. And I work in St. Anne, but I'm a proud Manchesterian. Wonderful. So the school is actually in St. Anne's. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. It's Thank on the you. board of Chulani and St. Anne. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I told you that we were talking to someone of who is making impact and influence in her field. So let me hurry along because I know my audience have so many questions to ask you tonight. Go ahead and put those questions in the chat. And um, also you can raise your virtual hand and ask um, Dr. Thomas, um, when we get into that section, but let me hurry along. Um, Dr. Thomas, um, you talked about technology. I hear you talk about making, putting up that post and having those um, different types of technology for the children to use. Technology has become the most vital resource for schools, not just for schools, for almost every person, even since COVID. Um, in your personal opinion, um, and you hinted on this a little bit before. Do you consider this um, to be a real blessing or do you consider it to be, I, I, don't, I won't, don't want to say a curse, but how do you view this, this thing with technology um, in your schools? My personal opinion about that is that it is a, a double-edged sword and it depends on whose hand it is in. Because I find that there are children who use it for research, use it to engage, use it to improve themselves, use it for empowerment, monitored by their parents. And I find that there are some children who use it to destroy themselves because they get onto programs, they, they create things that, that, that make you wonder if, 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 there are some, if there is a force propelling them to destroy themselves. And so to me, it is, is, it is a, a, a two-edged sword. And the hand that it is in determines the use that is made from it. I also find that if persons are not directed, the same way that you direct persons and children when they're in a new job to, to, to get accustomed to the informal structure, children are to be guided how to use, maximize the use of the gadget so they get the maximum benefit from it because they are left willy-nilly, because it's so easy. Because even before COVID, I had an issue when parents just gave their children their cell phone to use, to do anything they want, to play games and to do that. If they were interrupting a conversation where they were gossiping about some person's change in their life, or if they were distracting them, if they were busy doing something, they, I found that they just gave them the phone and children were just left to do whatever they want with the phone. It's the same issue in schools. And so there are some persons who use it for their benefit and there are some who use it to destroy themselves. If they, the balance is not put down and as parents, as educators, as stakeholders, as society builders, we do not intentionally teach these persons, adults and children, how to use technology to empower themselves and for their maximum benefit, it becomes a curse. It's no longer a blessing. In fact, it becomes, in my mind, a terrible weapon, a terrible regressive weapon. 
Wow. I, I can only say wow to that response because when I ask you the question, Dr. Thomas, I thought about it can be on both sides, but you have so carefully and precisely explained that, that two-edged sword, and, and that is so true. But what I want to kind of put a follow-up question to that um, in terms of the learning styles, uh, because sometimes you can give a student a diagram or something to look at and they learn better, and the, the other students, you give them just something to read and they learn the same. Um, based on the different learning style, how easy or how challenging is it to create, you know, these curriculums um, for, for, for these students that you, you are um, managing and, and working with. And it brings also, it maybe also pull back technology into the thing as well. So may say they learn better with the technology. Well, first of all, uh, there is in schools, the thrust, and, and some of us manage it very well and some do not, because of, of course, you would need the training. But as a curriculum and instructional specialist, I have always adopted my curriculum. And I, I never waited until post-COVID to adopt my cur 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 curriculum. So my curriculum was always an evolving one. And it always focused on the needs of my students because I am a data-driven individual. And so I don't make any assumptions about what students should learn and what they should not learn. What we do is we look at their, we, we, we center our curriculum in my school in an inquiry based way. So it is rarely that students are allowed to inquire and to ask questions about their learning. And the, 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 the curriculum itself is modified to suit their situation. Because I find that rural school students, and I make no apologies, are, are, are problem solvers naturally. And so the curriculum has to be geared and evolved and personalized to make sure that these children have been to solve their problems daily, are able to have problems that they solve. So it's problem based. And so my children get a problem of the day every single day. And then I find that because most of these students in rural schools are keen to how they survive, because a lot of these persons, their parents are farmers. And so they are geared to how do I survive as a farmer and still match the, the wider and broader society in a context where I am seen as less than or a stepchild of society or the bastard child of society because we actually condescendingly and without notice and without really consciously doing it, see persons from rural communities as being less than persons of urban communities. And I look at it to say that the both of them have a brain. The brain is structured the same way. And, and so I have to say that rural school children have more problems to solve. And so we gear the community in that. They have to motivate themselves. And so I give them a motivation and thought every single day. They have to wonder how the next thing is gonna go, how they're gonna maybe walk this distance and then how they're gonna get there, how they're gonna use the money that they have to maximize and to get them to, to get what they want. And so we teach them those skills. And we have a lot of extracurricular activities as a part of modification of the curriculum where they learn these things. So we have a math club, we have a drama club, we have sign language club because those are the things that they need to learn to move themselves on. And we have the 4-H club that we do very, very well in. We do the JCDC and, and as a club, as we need a club, I add another. Because if someone emerged, whatever emerged from my school that I see, and I see everything as having potential and, and being able to, to push and propel students forward because it comes from them naturally. Whatever is natural in my children, whatever the inclination is, I broaden my, my, my curriculum to accommodate them. That's it. Uh, Dr. Thomas, I, I smiled and my heart was warmed just a minute ago when I listened to you because it brought me back to my own experience when I taught at um, Northern Caribbean University back in the years. I used to go in class every evening and I used to put a motivational quote on the, on the blackboard, on the chalkboard. And when I heard you talk about that, it just warmed my heart because this helped the students so much. 
to really view things, not just in what you're reading to, from the book to them or what you're teaching from the book, but to see things outside of the book as well. And I really, really, really commend you for that again. I told you we were going to be talking to a woman of impact and influence in her field. And I, I'm going to repeat it again. They maybe need to clone your Dr. Thomas and put one of you in all the schools across Jamaica. I'm not sure if there are many of you in all of those schools, but thank you so much for the work you're doing. I know we, we will have quite a bit of questions. So I'm going to wind on my question right now. I could ask you some